We seem to have critical mass, so let's dive in. My name is Sonella Cook. I am CEO of Galba Catalyst, and I'm here along with Nigel Sizer on behalf of the Coalition to Prevent Pandemics at the Source. This coalition is a group of health and conservation actors that have joined forces to ensure that we address the root cause of most pandemics, the spillover of pathogens from animals into humans. We are grateful to our coalition members for being the force behind this effort. The background slide that you'll see in a second shows the powerhouse of thinkers and doers that make up this coalition. Please also visit preventingfuturepandemics.org for more information. We are delighted to be co-hosting this event with His Excellency Per, Or per Olsen Fried, Sweden's Minister for International Development Cooperation. A few housekeeping notes. We are recording today's event and will make the highlights publicly available in the coming days. If you'd like to tweet live, the hashtag for the event is on the screen, hashtag preventing pandemics. We do have a tight agenda, so unfortunately can't guarantee that we'll get to Q&A from the audience, but if you do have questions, please enter them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in case we're able to respond. Let me give you a sense for the agenda. We'll start with opening comments from the co-hosts of today's event, and then share with you a video that provides a helpful overview of the topic. Dr. Ari Bernstein of Harvard, who is chair of the Scientific Task Force to Prevent Pandemics, will, pre will present some of the key findings of the task force. After that, we'll hear a brief keynote message from Jane Goodall, and we'll then move into the panel discussion. And when that's done, we'll wrap up with a few selected questions and hopefully with some audience Q&A as well, if we're able to. So why are we here today? The world is still reeling from this pandemic without detracting from the importance of continuing to respond to the current crisis, today's event focuses on the efforts currently underway to build back better. There is much talk of pandemic prevention, preparedness and response, but all of the current prevention efforts focus on outbreak response, meaning what we do once a disease has emerged. Maybe because of the siloed ways in which we work, we continue to ignore the root cause of the problem, the spillover of pathogens from animals into humans. Today's event is meant to highlight the importance of that neglected but critical part of the solution. There are some that would say it's too difficult to prevent spillover and we should just focus on responding to disease outbreaks. But thanks to the work of the scientific task force, we have a strong scientific evidence base for why we cannot afford to ignore prevention at the source. Prevention at the source is especially important because responding to disease outbreaks may not be effective on its own. Even if we do everything we're setting out to do to try and contain the outbreaks and prepare health systems, if the virus mutates quickly, if it can incubate unnoticed for long periods of time, all of our preparedness and response efforts would be in vain. Spillover prevention is not airtight either, but with those two elements together, at least we are attacking the problem comprehensively. Ignoring spillover prevention means that we are fully missing a huge portion of the solution we must incorporate into our thinking a more accurate view of what it will take to truly prevent the next pandemic. Thank you for being here with us today. We hope this event gives you a sense for the imperative we have to think about pandemic prevention differently. We hope it opens the door to new possibilities and inspires collective action. None of us can do this alone, but together we have a fighting chance. We appreciate each of you for making the time to hear from this esteemed group of speakers and panelists we are also deeply thankful to our co-host, Sweden's Minister for International Development Cooperation. Let me hand over to Coalition co-founder, Dr. Nigel Sizer, Executive Director of Preventing Pandemics at the Source. Thank you, Sunilla, for your leadership conceiving the initiative on preventing pandemics at the Source. And thank you everyone for joining, especially our speakers. Thank you to our amazing coalition members and huge thanks to Sweden's Minister of International Development Cooperation, Per Olsen Fried, for co-hosting, and to your wonderful team at the Ministry, who have worked so closely with us to make this symposium possible, especially Charlotte Roda, Ellen Kelden, and Dr. Anders Nordström. I hope that all of us here today are healthy and fully vaccinated. Many of us are indeed very fortunate some of us might even admit that we have actually enjoyed some of the changes the pandemic has wrought. A break from long commutes, no boss peering over our shoulder, more treasured time with family. But for millions who have lost loved ones, 
or are coping with long COVID. And for the billions of less privileged people around the world, however, COVID-19 has been a horrific experience. A year since effective vaccines were developed, less than one in 20 people in Africa has received even one vaccine dose. Hundreds of millions of workers and their families have fallen into deep poverty, and many have no idea when jobs and some level of financial security will return. Despite incredible scientific advances, by the time the pandemic is over, as many may have died as did 100 years ago in the Spanish flu, most of them will be poor people of color in the global south. So the most just and moral solution to prepare for future pandemics is to prevent them entirely, to stop them at the source, to prevent the spillover of viruses from wildlife to humans, which has been the origin of all pandemics in the last century. Prevention at the source protects everyone equally, rich and poor, black, brown and white, north and south. Our coalition of environmental, public health, science and human rights leaders, including COVID victim and survivor groups, came together around this moral imperative. We have looked into the science to chart a pathway to a comprehensive approach to prevent another COVID-19, as you will hear today. We know how to do it by better protecting tropical forests, addressing the trade in live animals, supporting the rights of indigenous and local communities who live with and protect forests and wildlife and through safer and more humane animal husbandry. Many of these measures are also key to help to address climate change and protect biodiversity. They also create thousands of jobs in the rural regions now struggling to emerge from the debilitating impacts of lockdown. Independent analysis shows that new spending on these measures annually equivalent to less than 1% of what the US alone has spent to protect the US economy since last year would be transformational. Transformational for pandemic prevention, for climate change, for biodiversity protection, and for the well-being of local communities. Today, we will hear from scientists, policymakers, and practitioners about their perspectives on this challenge. Thank you all, and now back to Sunila. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our co-host, His Excellency Per Olsen Fried, Sweden's Minister for International Development Cooperation. Thank you, Minister, for having the vision to see the interlinkages and opportunities at the intersection of animal, human, and ecosystem health, and for advocating a comprehensive approach to pandemic prevention. Uh, thank you, Sunila. Thank you, um, dear participants, <clears throat> dear speakers, dear members of the uh, Preventing Pandemics at the Source Coalition, everyone who's tuned in to follow this conversation. Uh, a warm welcome to, uh, uh, to this event. My co-hosts and I are very pleased uh, that we have all come together to discuss one of the most pressing topics uh, of, of our time on our life on the planet, the connection between human health and the health and well-being of our biosphere. The seriousness of the situation is not news to anyone. We are grappling with enormous loss of lives and livelihoods caused by the global pandemic. I think we can all agree that the price paid by individuals and societies, not least those who are already at the outset the most vulnerable, is absolutely unacceptable. Vaccines and investments in healthcare give some hope of a better tomorrow and are necessary, but not enough. This pandemic is happening in the midst of an accelerating planetary crisis. The planet has fever. We're currently overstepping the boundaries of what Earth, our only home, can handle. At the rate that we are going, there will be more droughts, floods, wildfires, hunger, and conflict in the years to come. And those who suffer the worst are those with no or less resources. Restoring our relationship with the biosphere through taking climate action and halting biodiversity loss is an urgent task for humanity. Given this, 
we need to understand the connection between how we treat our planet and human health. Nature loss and ecosystem degradation accelerate climate change and undermine food and water security for all of us. But it also places our livelihoods at risk in another way. It increases the risks of new global pandemics. Now I'm grateful to Dr. Bernstein and his team for compiling the knowledge that clearly tells us that to successfully prevent pandemics, we cannot afford to overlook the connection to nature and biodiversity protection, and vice versa. In our actions to turn the nature and climate crisis around, for example, with new commitments at COP26 and COP15, we must recognize the direct link to preventable disease outbreaks and the risks of new global pandemics. Now, there's a hidden cost to the way we live. The food we eat, the materials we use, and the way we form our landscape. Much of our development has come to the expense of nature, undermining ecosystems, fragmenting habitats, reducing biodiversity, causing greenhouse gas emissions, weakening natural carbon sinks, and increasing our exposure and vulnerability to new and emerging diseases. But there's an alternative to this. We must dare to imagine a future world where the Paris align alignment and Kunming compliance has brought us to a more sustainable place a place where our relationship with nature and the biosphere is redefined, enhancing livelihood for all of us, and where the risk of new pandemic emerging is less overwhelming and more manageable. To get there, everyone needs to take responsibility. Sweden's material footprint is too large to be sustainable. The same is true to our carbon emissions, but we are taking climate and biodiversity crisis seriously. The Swedish government is raising its ambitions, both in terms of, of national nature protection and climate action, and in our development cooperation as regards both global health and environment. The GEF replenishment process is an important vehicle for all of this, as well as delivering on our formulating on new bilateral and regional strategies. Now, please allow me to be frank. We, the industrialized countries with the means to transition, must lead the way. Rich countries that are causing the most damage must shoulder the fair share of responsibility. And I'm pleased that the EU is doubling its biodiversity financing. Many countries are engaging to make COP15 a success, both for setting national, international standards and integrating nature and biodiversity into all policy areas. All over the world, new steps are taken to protect biodiversity and restore degraded ecosystems. And there's a huge potential in bringing our climate and biodiversity and health closer together. But we also need a mental shift. The recognition that ensuring the best attainable human health is not limited to access to vaccines. What is good and important for people's health is also crucial of crucial importance for our planet and biosphere. Complementary to a rollout of vaccinations across the world, we need long-term investments and sustainability. Human well-being starts with a reset in our relationship with the nature and biosphere. Thank you very much. Looking forward for these discussions. Thank you very much, Minister, for those important and incredibly inspiring words. We would now like to premiere a short video, just four minutes long, produced and funded by the incredible conservation media team at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which is part of Cornell University. This will also be available on YouTube after today's event and is endorsed by the Coalition to Prevent Pandemics at the Source. Let's play the video. Millions dead, hundreds of millions infected, countless jobs lost, trillions in losses to the global economy. These are just some of the consequences of the COVID pandemic. We still don't know the full impact. What we do know is that this pandemic happened in part because of our broken relationship with nature. New diseases are emerging faster and faster. Infectious diseases like COVID-19 will appear again unless we address 
the root of the problem and prevent pandemics at their source, at the point of spillover. Zoonotic spillover is the process by which viruses jump from animals to people. Just like Ebola, HIV, and now COVID, most new infectious diseases come from animals, and the majority come from wildlife. Once a new virus is in humans, containing its spread in our interconnected world can be extraordinarily challenging. Investment in containment, preparedness, and response is important and necessary, but it is not enough. Spillover prevention is essential if we want to avoid another global pandemic. The main drivers of spillover are deforestation and land use change, wildlife farming, markets and trade, and livestock production in close proximity to wildlife. Every time humans cut down forests, we increase contact between human and wildlife populations and increase our chances of a new virus spilling over. Wildlife trade and markets are another pathway for spillover, with stressed and often injured animals mixed together, creating the perfect conditions for the emergence and spillover of novel viruses. Livestock production near the forest edges puts wildlife in close contact with domestic animals, increasing the chances of spillover. And the crowded conditions on industrial farms are often similar to those of wildlife markets, with pigs and poultry serving as ideal hosts for viruses. The good news is that government-supported prevention can achieve rapid, large-scale results that reduce pandemic risk. In Indonesia, there has been significant progress in slowing deforestation over the last four years due to a government moratorium on forest clearing and strengthened law enforcement. In China, the national government has taken action to close wildlife markets. And in northern Thailand, villagers are able to track instances of unusual disease in livestock and wildlife through a locally built app. These solutions have important secondary benefits, like combating climate change and preserving biodiversity. But now we know that when we fight for the forests and their wild animals, we are also fighting for our own lives. The global cost of a comprehensive plan to stop future pandemics is estimated to be as little as $20 billion annually, with up to $10 billion needed for spillover prevention. This is a small price to pay compared to the millions of lives and trillions of dollars lost to COVID. The COVID pandemic has taught us that we need a new, expanded approach to global health. Now is the time for governments across the globe to address the root causes of infectious diseases and invest in preventing pandemics at the source. By doing this, we can stop the next global pandemic before it starts. A huge thanks again to the Center for Conservation Media at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for that incredible contribution to our coalition and this effort. I am now honored to introduce Dr. Ari Bernstein, Interim Director of the Center for Climate, Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He is also a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bernstein led a task force of scientists from around the world as they sought to identify the most effective ways to prevent new infectious diseases like COVID-19 before they start. The scientific task force operated independently from our coalition to ensure that our positions and actions are based on the best available science. Dr. Ari Bernstein, welcome. Thank you so much, Sonella. Uh, I want to thank you, Sonella, and Nigel in particular for your stalwart leadership of the coalition and uh, for helping organize this event. And also, of course, on that front, uh, a deep thanks to uh, Minister Olson-Fried. Uh, it's a real honor to 
uh, take part in this event, which is a wonderful uh, series of uh, presentations and, and discussions around the issue of, as you've heard, preventing pandemics at the source. I'm particularly uh, interested in hearing from our panel, um, many of whom have had distinguished roles in addressing uh, a path forward around this pandemic. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing their uh, responses to what I am presenting, uh, which is about a task force that we assembled at Harvard University this summer to look into the science that speaks to pandemic prevention. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the task force was intended to be comprised of individuals who represented different continents, different cultures, uh, as well as different scientific backgrounds. So uh, Dr. Yvande Alimi, uh, who will be speaking in the panel uh, from the Africa CC, uh, Jonathan Epstein, who is a uh, 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 fundamentally a, a vet who studies bats, um, works for Eco Health Alliance, uh, Marcos Espial, who uh, is with the Pan American Health Organization, uh, Manish Kakar, uh, who works with the World Health Organization, uh, Debbie Kochivar, who I believe has actually joined the event today, uh, is intimately familiar with One Health and has been a leader uh, in advancing One Health strategies to address disease emergence, and uh, Guilherme uh, Wernick, who, uh, based in Brazil, has spent uh, his career studying zoonoses in South America. Uh, the charge of the task force was to look at the science in the same way that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPBES, uh, does for climate biodiversity. Uh, and uh, we really came to three conclusions, which you'll see here. One is we, we can prevent pandemics. Uh, two, we must prevent pandemics at the source. And when we do that, it's quite clear that our salvation from pandemics comes cheap. Next slide, please. We've heard a lot about uh, the difference between preparedness and prevention. And I just want to be clear because it's so critical to understanding the challenge we've been dealing with the pathogen after it's gotten into people. And as you heard from uh, uh, the minister uh, and Nigel Sizer and Sinella Cook, uh, this is really uh, an issue because preparedness actions have their limits. <laughs> um, prevention, of course, is imperfect, but as you heard, uh, there, there, there can be real downsides to taking a preparedness-only approach. It would be similar uh, if we just did preparedness actions, including vaccines or drugs, as you see here, uh, just healthcare system strengthening. Doing those things would be tantamount to just investing in climate adaptation and not doing mitigation which no one at this point would say is a wise way to approach climate change. Uh, and yet right now we're at a position where the vast majority of attention and funding remains on after the fact preparedness. Next slide, please. So in the task force report, uh, we made clear, as you heard, uh, that uh, the key point uh, of pandemic emergence, or even any emerging infectious disease uh, is spillover uh, from wild animals into people, sometimes via domesticated animals. And what's interesting is that if you look at many of the frameworks that look at uh, emerging infectious diseases, uh, they don't even present spillover as a part of a series of events that can lead to pandemic risk. Now, uh, there have been seven pandemics uh, since the early 20th century. All of them have been viruses from animals to people, with the exception of one, which is cholera, uh, which is a bacteria. But certainly in recent years, uh, the diseases like COVID-19 that strike suddenly and can spread quickly uh, are viruses, and those viruses have all come from wild animals into people, sometimes by livestock. And we have to focus on protecting their habitats protecting their ecosystems uh, so that we don't create interfaces that allow for their uh, pathogens to spread into people. Uh, and so we see time and again that, uh, as you saw in the video, as habitats get destroyed, as ecosystems change, whether that's from 
uh, land use changes or climate change or any other uh, driver of, of uh, habitat loss or degradation, uh, it can increase the chance for those pathogens to get into people. Uh, and the main question though, and I think it's important to address at this point is, why is it inadequate to simply do preparedness? Because after all, if we had excellent surveillance and a lot of vaccines uh, that were quickly available uh, and better health systems, one could argue that, oh, maybe just a few people would get sick. Uh, and th that's something we know how to do really well. Uh, maybe that's a good way to go. Next slide. So I'm gonna show you a couple of the fundamental reasons why preparedness measures alone, uh, post spillover interventions aren't gonna cut it. Uh, so these are two maps of the world. And I want you to guess which one is a map of per capita GDP and which one is a map of vaccine coverage for COVID-19. So you could probably tell the difference based on a few countries. For example, the United States uh, has very high GDP, but actually not the world's best vaccine coverage. But it's a pretty close rule. The richer a country is, the more vaccine for COVID is likely to help its membership. And that means that there's a fundamental inequity with relying on preparedness activities. Uh, things like vaccines and drugs and tests are always going to favor richer countries first. And yet we know that the countries that are most vulnerable to, to emerging infections are low and middle income countries where the healthcare infrastructure may not be as robust, that the access to drugs and vaccines may not be as great. So we cannot do preparedness only and hope to promote health equity and protect critically the gains in human health and economic development that we have worked so hard and so long to achieve. Next slide, please. But there's a more fundamental reason why we must prevent pandemics at the source. Here are two pictures of Earth. The one on the left is the first full disk image of the Earth ever taken, November 10th, 1967. The second is from July of this year on the right. In the mere 55 years between these two images, our population, the human population has more than doubled from 3.2 billion to 7 billion people. Over half of the tropical forests worldwide have been lost and untold numbers of species along with them. The amount of greenhouse gases pumped into the atmosphere has rapidly destabilized the climate, including making July 2021 the hottest July ever recorded on the planet. We cannot act as though we are living on an earth of the past, on a planet with a more stable climate and biosphere. Preparedness may help us lessen the blow from the next emerging infection, but it will do nothing to halt the tumult in the living world of the climate crisis, each of which contributes to the very risk of emerging infections that we're trying to address. Next slide. How do we prevent pandemics at the source? The task force uh, was very clear in, in looking at this issue. What are the main drivers of the spillover of pathogens? Uh, forests, tropical forests in the tropics. Loss of forests in the tropics is a major driver. Uh, most often for agricultural uh, purposes are forest cleared, but for other reasons as well. Wildlife consumption uh, is a key interface. People uh, who are um, eating wild animals are at risk of spillover. Uh, this is, of course, a very challenging area because for many of those people, that is their primary, one of their primary nutrition sources. And yet we have seen instances in which there have been successful uh, transitions of diets away from riskier animals into less risky ones in, in communities uh, where spillover of pathogens is high risk. Wildlife trade. Wildlife trade is one of the stickiest problems uh, that we come across in terms of its management, but there's no question that we can do better. Uh, particularly in the wildlife trade, and there's evidence that the further along you go in the chain from harvesting an animal in the wild to a consumer somewhere often in a richer country, uh, risk for spillover may grow, particularly in markets where animals may be collected in unnatural assemblies uh, and hygiene may be poor, uh, people are at risk. But we've seen spillover in wildlife trade uh, at all points along the way. 
And lastly, of course, as the video made so clear, uh, we have to be very careful with our production of livestock, particularly when it is close uh, to forest edges and wildlife populations, but also uh, in highly dense uh, uh, aggregations of animals, particularly pigs and chickens, which have key roles to play in the development of pandemic influenza strains. Next slide, please. So one of the questions that of course comes up is how much is it gonna cost and to address uh, spillover risk, to really do what I would call primary prevention of pandemics. Uh, a group of uh, scientists uh, came together uh, last summer uh, before our task force report and published a policy form in, in science that suggested that to make a significant dent in the risk of spillover in the parts of the world where spillover is most likely, and also importantly, biodiversity uh, uh, is quite robust, uh, would cost on the order of 20 to $30 billion a year. Now, some of that could come from a fund, uh, a multilateral fund, uh, but other funds should ultimately come from uh, national governments uh, operating within their own countries. And that sounds like a lot of money until you look at the costs as we've heard of COVID-19, which are on the order of $10 trillion uh, globally, or even frankly, the investment in healthcare system strengthening uh, around the world, the amount of money that is spent to improve health systems uh, in the form of aid across borders uh, is on this order of magnitude. Uh, and so uh, we have a real challenge, not in the costs uh, of, of what it takes to prevent uh, a pandemic because in the spectrum of what pandemics cost, it is small. The challenge we have is recognizing that a dollar spent in conserving uh, nature is a dollar spent in conserving ourselves. Next slide. I want to finish with a story about what I see as an incredibly important model in how we think about integrating uh, human welfare and the welfare of all other living things uh, on the planet. And that comes from an organization called Health and Harmony. Uh, starting in 2007, Health and Harmony, led by Dr. Kinnery Webb, began working in Gunung Palong National Park in Indonesia uh, with the people who lived there and the forests they called home. People living in this rainforest were forced to choose between protecting their own health and health care and protecting the forest that they lived in. Uh, they were uh, felling trees, chopping down trees, uh, to pay for their own health care. Through what Dr. Webb calls radical listening, which is pictured here, uh, working in solidarity with the community, was born a radical idea, provide greater access to health care to prevent illegal logging. To date, implementation of community-designed solutions to increase Access to healthcare, sustainable livelihoods, and conservation education has resulted in 90% reductions in illegal logging by participating households, which protects the habitat of critically endangered Bornean orangutans. These interventions led to a 67% decrease in infant mortality and improvements to a suite of other health indicators in the community from malarial diseases and diarrheal illness. To forestall the next pandemic, stabilize the climate and biosphere, and ensure healthcare access, health system strengthening, and conservation must be united. Just as Health and Harmony has done in Borneo and is beginning to do in Madagascar and Brazil, we believe nature and the planet can save ourselves, and they can. And that's exactly what the task force realized in the context of looking at the science that bears upon this question of pandemic risk and spillover. But we also have to realize that the reverse can be true as well. When we invest in health system strengthening, we can promote the conservation of nature upon which our health wholly depends. Thanks again for being here.
And I'm really looking forward to hearing the comments of our panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein, for your incredible contribution. Uh, and we are very grateful that you and your team at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health will be continuing to advise our coalition as we continue. Today, we are delighted to announce that the Jane Goodall Institute is joining our coalition, bringing decades of deep experience working with communities and nature across the world. Their founder and chair, world-renowned primatologist, conservationist, and humanitarian, Dr. Jane Goodall has prepared a short video for our event, for which we are immensely grateful. This will also be available on YouTube after the event, and I hope that you appreciate her inspiring words. Let's see the video. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to say a few words of this important gathering. I want to emphasize the thing that separates us most from other animals is the explosive development of our intellect. And yet, despite this, we're destroying our only home. We make decisions that lead to short-term gain at the expense of protecting the environment for future generations. We embrace the absurd idea there could be unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources. As we pollute land, air, rivers and oceans, we harm all life forms, including our own. The COVID-19 pandemic was caused by our relentless destruction of the natural world and exploitation of wild and domestic animals. We created conditions that enabled pathogens to spill over from animals to people relatively easily. Scientists studying these zoonotic diseases have been warning us of the inevitability of, of a pandemic such as COVID-19 for years. Alas, we did not listen. Now we pay the price. People tend to forget we're part of and depend on the natural world for air, water, food, everything. But we depend on healthy ecosystems in which the interrelated plant and animal species all have a role to play, creating a living tapestry. Each time a species becomes extinct, a thread is pulled from that tapestry until it hangs in tatters the ecosystem collapses and human livelihoods and health are compromised. And this is especially disastrous for poor communities. Climate change is having a devastating effect everywhere with terrible hurricanes, floods, droughts, heat waves, forest fires and rising sea levels. It's very clear that we must develop a new relationship with the natural world and our animal relatives because our health and well-being is inextricably linked with the health and well-being of the environment in which we live. There are many blueprints for change. We can move forward in a more ethical and sustainable direction. But will we have the will to take action now before it's too late? Thank you. So inspiring. Hello. Thank you, Jane, for that wonderful message. And thank you to the Jane Goodall Institute for joining our coalition today. We will now move into the panel discussion part of the agenda, and I'll, I'll hand over to Dr. Anders Nordstrom. Dr. Nordstrom holds the key position of Global Ambassador for Health with the Swedish, Minist Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. He was previously head of CEDA, the Swedish Development Agency, and has had a very distinguished career in public health, including serving at one point as acting director general of the World Health Organization. Dr. Nordstrom, over to you. Thank you so very much, uh, Sonia, and to everyone. Um, you have introduced me, so I will not say anything more about myself. Instead, I'm thrilled now to be able to engage with a very exciting panel um, to speak about what we just heard the very serious and sober messages from Jane about um, do we, is, is the will there to deal with the ethical and more long-term sustainable challenges that we all are aware about, but is the will really there? 
Uh, and what we heard from Dr. Bernstein in terms of focusing more on prevention, saying that it is actually possible to prevent future pandemic and that preparedness is not enough. And that there is a high return in investments if we are prepared to pay now and not just waiting and paying in the future. So in the panel now, um, and that will be the next part of this uh, webinar, uh, I'm delighted to have uh, the Right Honourable Helen Clark, former Prime Minister, but also former Minister of Health from New Zealand and also the former Administrator for UNDP and was now very recently one of the co-chairs for the Independent Panel for Preparedness, um, for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Uh, then we have Dr. Al Alimi uh, with us from Addis Ababa. Uh, Dr. Alimi uh, was part of the task force and she's the lead person within the African CDC on AMR issues where the One Health approach and the bridges in between health and environment is critical. Then we're delighted to have the head of the CEO and the chairperson of the GEF, the Global Environmental Facility with us, former Minister of Environment and Energy in, from Costa Rica, uh, Carlos Rodriguez. Then we're also very delighted to have the, the Vice Minister of Health from Indonesia with us, Dr. Dante Gurovono. Um, Indonesia is going to take on now the leadership for the G20 next year after Italy. So Indonesia, a very important country in terms of political decisions. And last but not the least, um, Dr. Christian Samper, who is the Vice President and CEO of the Wildlife Conservation Society. I hope that we can have a conversation here among the five of you. Um, what I would like to do is first to provide just a one, two minute reflection, comments, reaction from each of the five of you on what you just heard now from Dr. Bernstein. Do you agree? Any reactions, any messages? And then I'll, we'll come back to each of you with some more in-depth questions. But Helen, first over to you. Thanks, Anders. Greetings, everyone. Well, I, I'm a convert. I mean, everything I've heard uh, makes sense. We, we face a syndemic of issues. There are linkages between all of them, and we need policymakers to think holistically about how to address these uh, in a, a coordinated way. Uh, our ecosystems have intrinsic value, but they also have ecosystem services they provide to the, the planet as a whole and to us as human beings. And we damage those ecosystems at our peril. The links to human health uh, of climate change are increasingly uh, highlighted and I think provide a, a way into the climate issue that may relate uh, more to uh, more people because in the end our, our health is something very central to each one of us. So I think also making the, the links uh, between the health of our ecosystems, our forests, our wildlife habitats and our human health because of the threat of zoonotic, zoonotic uh, disease spillover is incredibly important and it may help mobilize uh, more support uh, across the set of challenges then uh, might come if we dealt with them one by one. So I really congratulate the uh, researchers and those who've put forward the case uh, for prevention and seeing the linkages in such a compelling way. Thank you very much, Helen. Let me come back to you about that link, uh, but on more on a practical basis, how can we ensure that that is actually happening? How do we ensure that that integration, that linkage is actually materializing? Because we agree, uh, but let me come back to you uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, so, so just next, Dr. Alimi, you were part of the task force, but still some reflections from you initially, what you've heard now from Dr. Bernstein, but also from Jane. Um, Javande, please. Thank you very much. And yes, I was indeed part of that. Um, but every now, I, every now and then when I go back and look at the report, I get new insights to it. I think more than ever, COVID pandemic has really has been an eye opener to us. For poorer countries, for countries in, glo in the global south, more than ever, we need to invest in preventing these disease outbreaks. Because uh, in terms of the pandemic, we have we have we have taken the the, the worst eat in terms of um, um, supplies, in terms of vaccines, um, in terms of testing and things like that, PPE for healthcare workers. So more than ever, we know that it is a good time for us to invest in multi-sectorial one-out coordination mechanisms. Um, now, 
we we need to know that it's it's not um, no sector can address it alone. There's, we are so interconnected, and we need to heavily um, invest in in agriculture as well as environmental health sectors, yes. such that we we are able to work very closely with them um, from the human health sector. So I think for us, uh, uh, for many countries in the global south. Um, it, it must be more of rather than focusing on response, it must be us focusing on um, on preventing this disease outbreaks. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. Let me come back to you again in a few minutes about what African governments are doing, and especially within the context of the African Union. Uh, the African CDC has really been a leader, but politically, what is happening in Africa? I'd like to come back to you on that. But first, uh, Carlos, um, the Global Environmental Facility, I suppose you will you agree on everything as well that has been said. Uh, but but still, any reflections from your side on what you heard from both Dr. Bernstein and from Jane, where well, we thank, are and where we should go? Thank you so much, Anders. And uh, it is evident that uh, we need to stop um, destruction of nature and natural ecosystems. But people don't realize that we humans invest many, ma many times more uh, uh, financial resources and activities that generate uh, deforestation, loss of biodiversity and contribute to climate change change than what we invest uh, in nature conservation. Today, Anders, humans invest 143 times more financial resources and economic activities that contribute to uh, deforestation than what we invest in nature conservation. This is a report of UNDP. Most of mm -hmm. that, 80% of that is uh, related to agriculture and the rest energy mining infrastructure. So at the end of the day, even though we connect the dots within healthy ecosystems and healthy people, we need to change the decision-making systems, uh, the national planning processes and bring the One Health approach into this. And, and in order to, this, uh, to do this, we need to narrow the gaps, the political gaps and decision-making gaps from the UN system where UNEP need to talk and coordinate and plan with the World Health Organization all the way down to the country level mm -hmm. where ministers of environment and ministers of health need to plan and invest together, not continue to work on silos because uh, we won't be able to go from a negative investment scheme into a positive one where we can be investing more in protecting nature than in destroying nature. Thank you. And again, let me come back to you uh, because you're sitting on quite a lot of money. Uh, the GEF is sitting on quite a lot of money. The question is what you can do and what you have done from, from the GEF perspective of actually pursuing this agenda. So let's talk a little bit more about money in a few minutes. Um, Minister Dante from, from Indonesia, uh, just first checking that you are with us because there was a bit of a connection problem. But if you are there, Minister, please, can you come in with your reflection and on what you have heard? Just a, one, two minutes, and then I will come back with a specific question to you uh, slightly later. But Minister Dante, are you with us? Yes. Yes, Anderson. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to see yeah. you. Good evening from Jakarta. On my own 15, 2017, the Time magazine headline, warning, we are not ready for the next pandemic. And it only needs less than three years to see that the world is, in fact, not ready. Six out of 10 human infections are estimate of animal origins. And three out of four new emerging infection disease is the past three decades are uh, originated in an animals. A zoonosis disease with such a magnitude as COVID-19 has shown us that the imbalance and destructive interactive between human, animal, and environment has wide impact. We need to make interactive between human, animal, and the ecosystem more harmonious to prevent the next pandemic. We agree the report on scientific tax for preventing pandemic next described one health approach as one of the best by in the preventing future animal on human spillover and pandemic prevention. Aside from partnership between the three party and UNEP, the global level, we need to strengthen collaboration between agency responsible for human, animal and environment health in the country level implementing on one health approach. We need to extend effort delivering trustworthy data sharing, including genomic data, to enable real-time integrated global surveillance of human, animal, and plant disease. Taking advantage big data, artificial intelligence, and internet of things. Uh, we 
also find the can, can I ask you, Minister, sorry, just because I want to just a short introduction sort of comments from you. You will come back and have more time in a few minutes. Okay. So if okay. you can save a little bit of your intervention until slightly later. Uh, but that was a very strong first message from your side. And then let me come back to you in a few minutes. Uh, because I would like also to hear from Christian Samper, um, the president of the Wildlife Conservation Society, your sort of just initial reaction on what you've heard. Uh, thanks, Anders. It's great to join my colleagues in this panel, and I'm delighted to see this report. I think it brings together and confirms a lot of the science of what we have known uh, for more than 20 years in many ways, that this interface between human health and wildlife health is absolutely crucial. And I think this, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic is a real wake up call for the world. I think one thing we forget is that these kinds of spillovers have happened for the last 20 years and that their frequency is increasing more and more. So I think we really need to come together and embrace this. And this is very much what we did a few years ago when we issued the Berlin Principles of One Health, which was just a few months before the pandemic outbreak. And it really outlines this case. So we have the science, now we really need to mobilize it and to invest in this, and we can discuss this later on the panel. Thank you so very much. And, and just listening to the five of you, I think uh, there is quite an agreement in terms of both what the issues are and what needs to be done moving forward. But coming back to you, Helen, then, um, there is a clear message here about that um, we have the knowledge, we have been warned, we know that the frequencies of zoonotic diseases are going to continue to be high, uh, and you talked about the importance of bridging environmental and health aspects when it comes to both prevention and preparedness work. So my, my question is, how can we do that? And the challenge, you have been a senior politician of dealing with long-term preventive issues uh, when the world is more keen to deal with the more urgent issues. So how can we ensure that we both invest in vaccines that is top on the political agenda now, but in the long-term preventive work and how do we bridge the environmental and health communities, Helen? I think it's about leadership. I think it's about having uh, leaders who will listen to the evidence and act accordingly. Uh, what we know, uh, whether it's trying to save our forests or, or trying to respond to a pandemic like the one we're wrestling with at the moment, is that populism that denies uh, science uh, causes distrust and cynicism, you know, perpetrates fake news. This is disastrous. It's disastrous for our climate, our forests, our, our health. So it's about leadership and leaders stepping up uh, to bring their ministers together, to bring their officials together around coordinated responses to these big, big challenges. Again, our, our panel and looking at you know, where things have gone wrong with the, the pandemic, where we go from a you know, local outbreak to a raging global pandemic, which we're still in the middle of, we identify the leadership deficit. Yeah. You know, these issues need to be dealt with and dealt with at source in a coordinated way with political leadership all the way through. And the challenge of dealing with or investing both politically and also financially uh, with long-term needs for prevention while you have also acute needs like now in the vaccines. Is it possible to do both things at the same time? I think leaders have to be honest and say we pay now or we pay later. You know, if mm. we don't invest now, the cost of not acting is so much greater. We, we, we know that with climate. We know that you know, we missed early steps uh, when this, this pandemic outbreak occurred. But if you wind back the clock, as the scientists are telling us now, uh, we, we could do much more to prevent zoonotic spillovers in general, and the, the savings from that will be immeasurable. You know, how many more times in our lifetime could, could we cope with events like this? We can hardly cope with, with this one. So whatever we do has to be geared to prevention on a broad front. Oh, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, let's come back to that. Uh, but Dr. Alimi, uh, uh, as I said, you're working with the African CDC. They are really shown strong leadership. We hear rumors that your boss might be on his way now to head the US PEPFAR program. In some way, I hope not for Africa because he's done such a great work. Uh, but what are you picking up from, as Helen was saying, from the political arena here within among the African countries? You're right in the center. You're in Addis by the African Union, have got their headquarters. What's the What's the political appetite, not just to get the vaccines there, but also to invest in the preparedness, the long-term investments needed? 
Um, I think for us, um, COVID-19 has really been a stepping stone for improving or strengthening One Health systems. Because more than ever, um, government and policymakers now seem to understand what we mean by zoonotic diseases. And um, now it's a bit more relatable. It's kind of like antimicrobial resistance as well. For the longest time, we have had conversations about this, but it's just not being relatable to many of them. But more than ever, we are starting to see a very um, rich appetite um, when it comes to national government. Um, there is keen interest to invest in um, animal health sectors as well as environmental health sectors. More than ever, uh, our governments are now starting to understand that we have so much um, rich biodiversity on the continent as well as wildlife, and it is necessary. Um, is, is part of the political commitment to give um, the continent as well as the, as the countries to protect the wildlife and invest in protecting biodiversity and, and, and the entire ecosystem on the continent. So I think we are starting to see quite an interesting uptake. And I think, uh, of course, you, basically, because we at the African Union have also reflected this leadership approach um, such that we are showcasing this um, multi-sectorial approach to addressing COVID-19. So more than ever, our member states are starting to follow the queue. We are starting to see uh, uh, more collaborations across all three sectors. We are starting to see it. And, and we are hoping to showcase this sometime in November to showcase most of the, um, some of the great best practices that has come out from the continent on one health and, and, and preventing zoonotic diseases. Excellent, excellent. Can I, can I ask you just a follow-up question? You, you are, as I said initially, leading on AMR in term, mainly in terms of how do we use or misuse um, uh, antibiotics. Um, and in some way, there, there is a lot of um, commonalities here in between how we misuse antibiotics and how we interfere with um, with nature in some way among both people and uh, animals. Can we learn from this when we talk about biodiversity and understanding how ecosystems are working and how we should interfere or sometimes not interfere, have stronger ecosystems and stronger both animal and, and human health? Can we learn from some, some of the work that has been done on the antibiotic, on the AMR side? Oh, yes, uh, indeed we are. Uh, yes, we can because one of the one of the unique things about the interconnectedness of AMR or how AMR slightly uh, uh, is uh, is uh, relatable to COVID nineteen is we have so many um, sort of cross cutting lessons which we really like to emphasize on. For example, looking at um, how we now do our sentinel surveillance using wastewater, um, which is, it, it wasn't quite common in Africa. But one of the things that has uh, progressed over the past few years, I must say, is the work that many people have been doing on antimicrobials in wastewater. So now we, are, we already have those the capacity to do that. Um, so it was just, it, it was rather a, an easy transition for us to start to, of course, explore, looking at what um, 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 SARS-CoV-2 would be like in our wastewater um, um, across the continent. And, and that's how we are trying to strengthen and improve our, our surveillance system. So that is one of the ways that um, 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 AMR has been really, um, um, uh, we, we have been able to borrow lessons from AMR, the progress we have made on AMR and transition it into COVID-19. No, oh, thank you. And I, I don't know whether whether Minister Folsom Fried Per would you like to come back to that this at the end, but the experience from Sweden, how we worked on AMR and, and the use of antibiotics in the Swedish society, both on the animal and human side, I think it's quite interesting because it has also been a lot about public opinion and what is really what is the demand from people. Uh, that has really helped changing the situation, but we might come back to that. But now over back to, to Carlos uh, and the Global Environmental Facility. And I said money, you said that um, the cost has been enormous compared to what is needed to be investing in, invested now in, the, in prevention. So, so my question is then, what role does the Global Environmental Facility play in terms of making sure that the money is available but possibly not just that the money is available, but, but that they are structured in the right way that are actually in some way fostering, stimulating uh, this integration in between uh, pandemic preparedness, human health and planet health. Is there anything from the guest perspective that you can share with us? Oh, definitely, yes, Anders. And, and the first point that we need to, to understand is that 
the cost of probation, uh, prevention and, and the cost of dealing with a pandemic um, is a smaller, lower, it will stop destroying nature. And, and that is a key element that we need to understand. Uh, in order to, to generate that, and as uh, Ms. Helen Clark said, we need uh, clear lead, political leadership that really understands <clears throat> the need for more political consistency and policy co coherence. Uh, we will never achieve our expected goals of prevention if we still finance the destruction of uh, economic activities that destroy nature and contribute to climate change. That, that is the bottom line of the conversation. The second element is that we at the Jeff, even though we are a large fund, the largest environmental fund, we only mobilize 0.5% of what should be mobilized to protect nature and to uh, revert uh, climate change and adapt to climate change. So we will never have enough funds to really cover the sustainability agenda, but we have enough funds to make a difference at the country level if we understand how do we help countries mobilize domestic resources more efficiently and in the right direction? How do we generate the proper political alignment that is reflected in the national planning processes? And how do we help countries deal with the institutional failure you know, we, we created agencies and institutions in the governments uh, designed to solve a problem, but they still work on silos. That is why we are investing public uh, many more times public resources in activities that destroy nature than uh, what we invest in protecting nature. So policy coherence is an extremely important element that we will be working in, in the next Jeff cycle as we will be helping countries deal with the, the, the recovery by using nature as a cost-effective way to become them more resilient and more prepared for future global events. Oh, uh, thank you. And, and GEF is an important partner in this, of course. Uh, but what Dr. Bernstein actually asked for was 10 billion. That's a lot of money per year. Um, that is much more than what GEF is managing today, of course. And it might be not GEF who should manage this kind of resources. And Helen, if you're still with us, this was the same thing as we suggested from the independent panel, saying that we need another 15, 10 to 15 billion US dollars per year to be invested in preparedness. Where are we going to get that kind of money from? Because now we're not speaking millions, we're speaking billions, and we're not speaking 1 billion, we're speaking 10 billion. Is that realistic? How yeah, can we it, do it? It, it, it? It's realistic. And our panel was very clear that this shouldn't be money that that's mobilized in a charitable way. It needs to come from some kind of assessed contribution uh, basis, a bit like countries are, are used to doing when they pay for their WHO member fees or their UN fees, uh, from each according to their means to each according to their needs. Look, we're in this together. You know, we, we, we can't as a global community allow any country which doesn't have resources to be the, the, the weak link. We, we have to show solidarity. And so, uh, you know, to raise 10 billion on a mechanism like that is, well, we would say in New Zealand, chicken feed, right? <laughs> Even the capacity to leverage from it, uh, the, the 100 billion you would need for the first, you know, uh, 100 days of response to a pandemic, it, it, it's nothing in the greater scheme of things. Look, we're, we're looking at a pandemic that's cost trillions to invest in tropical forest conservation, uh, habitat protection, uh, the, what we need to do for, for biodiversity. You know, a, a stitch in time always saves nine, and that's the case in expenditure across these areas of prevention at source. Thank you, Helen. And I really have appreciated working with you for a year and now improving my English, now picking up a few New Zealand sort of expressions. Uh, very much appreciated. But Carlos, back to you. A comment from you as well. What do you think? Uh, where can we get this kind of money from? And how should oh, we yeah. do it? I, I totally agree with Helen in, in her vision. But let me, let me say something also uh, of something that we don't put uh, much attention. Countries spend a lot of money uh, from public, invest a lot of money in public expenditures. Unfortunately, they don't do it efficiently and very well coordinated. If we understand the, the local decision-making processes and how countries assign their public expenditures, we can narrow that financial gap and be able to narrow that, um, that, um, that need. So this is something that the Jeff looks at uh, as we look uh, to implement the international environmental issues. So 
uh, we need to really understand that we have a homework in order to see what every single country is investing in their health, in their forests, and biodiversity, climate um, uh, budget. That is extremely important. And the last, last element, but not less important, uh, any solution should be based on a right uh, base up, with a right base approach because the human rights ele element is important. This is this is something that is not being brought into this discussion. This is something which is extremely important as we understand that the building back better should be um, a green, blue, clean, and resilient through a right base approach. No, thank you very much. Um, coming back to Indonesia and to Jakarta, uh, Minister Dante. Um, I mean, Indonesia is a huge country, both in terms of population and, and um, area. And you have huge um, forests, you have an enormous richdom in terms of species of animals, but you also are right in the middle of a, quite a difficult situation now face of the pandemic. What, what are your reflections from the Indonesian government side? Can we now both bring sort of the dimension of why biodiversity, investing in our environment, avoiding the spillover, possibly preventing the spillover in the future. Can we do that? Because you are really one of the most important countries for actually doing that in order for us to be able to prevent uh, the next pandemic. Is this something you, that you are discussing in Indonesia right now? Uh, we announcements that the protecting the tropical forest home to contest white wildlife that some of these prisons as natural reservoir from the pandemic prone pathogen may highly be considered as from uh, investment in preventing future pandemic. The connection between protection of tropical forests and reduction of risk of the new and emergency infection disease should receive announcement and support from the highest level of government. Although in Indonesia, the issue has not been explicitly and officially addressed. However, Indonesia has long been recognizing the the critical role of environment sector play in the determining of the health of the people, especially sure. one related of zoonosis disease. As I mentioned previously, it's beneficial effort into equipment and empowered a community to close proximity with wildlife and the natural world to respond quickly, approximately given there was proximity with the potential source spill over through yeah. proper yeah. advocacy for education as well as energy regulation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And this might be, I was, um, I mean, saying that, or, or that it's not really the focus of today, but you will be the chair of the G20 next year. And, and this present G20 group uh, that Italy is heading this year is, is very keen, of course, to see what the G20 can do, both Minister of Finance, Minister of Health, on the pandemic. And I'm sure Indonesia will take forward this agenda. So it might be that next year when you're chairing this, that we will have a slightly more of a green touch uh, on the continued discussion on, on how we can avoid uh, another pandemic of this nature. Let me come then finally to Christian Samper. Um, without, instead of giving you a question, I mean, what's your reflection on what you've heard? Uh, what do you think that we should do? What could a coalition like this mean? What would you like to see happening? Well, one of the most important things, as Carlos Manuel said, is to bring these uh, break down these silos and bring together different sectors. What's striking to me is the health sector has been focusing on response, but not prepare preparedness. And the environmental sector hasn't fully acknowledged that. Uh, in my organization, we very much work at that interface on health uh, and wildlife health, human health, and that's an important issue. One of the things that's important is preventing, we, we created right uh, in January, 2020, we created this preventive pandemics at the source coalition which is brings together a group of uh, not only environmental NGOs, but different health groups together to talk about this and to learn together. I think looking at this more holistically is something important and recognizing some of these win-win-win solutions. So for example, the protection of forests is not only good for biodiversity, it's really good for climate, it will prevent pandemics and it supports livelihoods and the rights approach that was mentioned. So I think we need to look at those. But the other one that I think has received less attention is the whole issue of wildlife trade. That is something we work on a lot. We know one of the main spillover uh, pathways is the consumption of wildlife. And I think there, this is not only an issue about money, it's an issue about policies. It's about really making sure governments step up and take the right policies to close some of these wildlife markets and to avoid some of these chains. And that alone 
It's not going to cost a lot of money, but it will have a huge impact in terms of reducing the spillover. I think those are the some of the things that we really need to focus on and bring down this agenda and focus on those win-win solutions that we need to do. Yeah, and I think yeah. preventing pandemics is one of the best solutions we have at our fingertips, and we're ready to work on it. No, thank you so much. That's one of my favorite sort of the win-win. <laughs> Looking for the win-win. We had a was a you know the big UN conference last week about. Uh, the food uh, systems, um, sustainable food systems. I mean, the only here you really have big win-win-wins in between the health and the climate agendas here. The, the better the way we change our food production, food consumptions, food waste, the better it is for the planet and the better it is for people's health. So win-win are really opportunities to save both people's time and, and money, etc. but to find and have common goals and work then towards those goals and trying to avoid just working in the silos. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Let's open up now to see whether we have some questions from, we have a huge audience that have been listening to you. Uh, and uh, we have um, quite a few questions. I, and I'd like to start with David Boy, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment. Um, David, can you come in yourself with your question? I don't know yes, whether thank the you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah, we can hear you. Brilliant. Please, David. Yeah, thanks for this terrific event and for all of the insights that you've shared. I, w I will say one thing that uh, until uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez spoke about human rights at the end, this was really strikingly absent from the conservation. And I think a rights-based approach to preventing pandemics is absolutely fundamental. You know, it focuses on those who are most vulnerable, it ensures accountability, and it empowers people to participate in solutions. And so my question, I guess, to the panel is, how do you envision human rights actually being used to uh, a rights-based approach, both to preventing future pandemics, but also to protecting the rights of those who, for example, do depend on wildlife for their, for their health, for their livelihoods, for their well-being. How can we actually achieve that win-win solution that you're speaking of? Thank you. Okay, so let's hold to that question. Let's take one or two more questions and then we have a couple of comments from the panelists. Uh, so one is then about um, the human rights and how you how that could be an effective way of um, having uh, making even more progress. Uh, let's see. I think we have a question also from Teresa Lim, who is the director for the Asian Center for Biodiversity. Teresa, are you with us? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Dr. Yes, we can Lodge? hear you. So please. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the, the ASEAN um, already has the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, which was adopted by the ASEAN leaders uh, last November 2020. It already outlines cross-sectoral and cross-pillar collaboration. Uh, it also serves as a regional, regional group blueprint for, the, for Southeast Asia for recovery. And, and it underscores uh, biodiversity and health. And health somebody nexus. is not muted. If somebody who's not speaking can mute, please. Please continue, Teresa. Okay. Sorry. Uh, it uh, underscores biodiversity and health nexus as it encourages individuals and communities in the ASEAN to become biodiversity literate and to adopt behaviors that address the root causes of zoonotic disease spread. So the, the, the leader's direction and policy is already present in the regional uh, level, but uh, of course, this is um, easier said than done, and uh, we're we're uh, uh, we're on our way to op operationalizing it. And um, well, this uh, of course, I'd like to listen from His Excellency Dante Harbuono of what uh, uh, the the lessons can he share from Indonesia uh, on uh, on on strengthening the biodiversity and health nexus and on and on cross-sectoral collaboration and how this can be uh, scaled up at the sub-regional level. Uh, for Dr. Alimi, for example, uh, she talked about country level, but you know how, how was this uh, scaled up at the African regional level, okay. this okay. cross-sectoral collaboration? Very good. So Thank question you. about scaling up both uh, within the Asian region and also the African region. Uh, one third final question, then we'll go back to the panel from uh, Nonette Royo, uh, who is the executive director for the Tenure Facility. Uh, Nonette, are you with us? I 
Do we have um, Nonet? Otherwise, we have Mr. Mormon from Bangladesh. Um, Mr. Mormon, are you with us? No, technology is not with us. So let's go back to the panel then. Uh, the first question was about uh, how we can use a human rights perspective and ensuring that by thinking and applying a human rights perspective, we can actually make more and better progress. Um, who would like to provide some comments on that from the, from the panel? Short and, and short. I will say, I, I will say Anders, that, that, that without a, a right-based approach, we'll never protect nature. We'll never protect forests and restore degraded ecosystems. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, from the conservation and climate community, know that well. So the, the rights-based approach of, for restoration and conservation is critical. Uh, 70, 70, 750 million hectares are in possession of uh, local communities. These are key for, for the protection of biodiversity, but also these are key to avoid and prevent uh, uh, zoonosis uh, spillover. So that, that is a key element. People consume, the forest dwellers consume um, wildlife and bushmeat because of their economic uh, uh, conditions. So if we, are able in, uh, if we are able to provide them with the rec financial recognition of the services that those forests provide in terms of water biodiversity and carbon, the socioeconomic economic elements will change dramatically and that will diminish, uh, diminish the tendency to consume uh, wild, wild meat. At the same time that we need to do a huge effort to include a new protocol in the UN Convention Against uh, Transnational uh, Organized Crime, where we need to include illicit wildlife trade because that's an uh, pending element that we need to bring into this conversation. Thank you. Uh, I saw Helen coming in there. Uh, this is close <laughs> to your heart, I'm sure. Well, uh, I was going to you know, raise the, the right to development because Carlos is right. You know, uh, the destruction of, of forests, for example, if people don't have sustainable uh, energy, it will be the nearest tree that is the source of the energy for the uh, for the charcoal. Uh, if there's not uh, access to you know uh, other food supply, then you know wildlife becomes uh, uh, poached for that, or or worse for you know the the, the products like ivory, rhino horn, and and so on. Also reinforcing what Carlos said about rights of indigenous people, because it's clear that where indigenous people uh, actually have the control and management of their forests, you get far better results for, uh, for forest conservation than uh, uh, if, if they are not empowered in that way. So there's a, a lot of rights issues to bring into this. Absolutely, um, thank you. Um, Christian, I think you'd like to come in, back in, but then I'd like after you also to ensure that we have one minute also for Dr. Alimi and for Minister Dante to say something about the scaling up. But but Christian first. Well, thank you. Let me continue connecting the dots and these win-win solutions. Uh, one of the things that we've been discussing last week here in the UN General Assembly has been this proposal of protecting 30% of the planet by 2030. I completely agree. The only way you can do that is by providing the rights and the tenure to some of the indigenous and local communities. And this is a win-win solution. We're looking at mobilizing resources that will help with the protection, that will sustain local livelihoods, and will be good for biodiversity. So we need to start linking these policies across sectors. And one last point I'd like to make is, the key issue here is not, not, I mean, the local livelihoods and local consumption by indigenous peoples of wildlife is not the big threat here. It is the markets. What you're looking at is when you have wildlife markets coming from different parts of the world or different cities, coming into these urban centers, that's where you get this perfect soup of all these viruses coming together. And that is where you have the biggest spillover. So the key issue here is the markets, not so much the local livelihoods. Thank you very much. Um, then finally then uh, to, to Dr. Alami, um, there were questions about the scaling up and we have that for Minister Mount, uh, Dante as well, but Alami for, uh, uh, Dr. Alami first. What's your, what's your view in terms of how we can scale up across a continent like Africa experiences? Um, so from our experience um, at the African Union, our approach was we started at the scale up level and now we are going down to country level. So what we did was 
um, creating enabling environments for the government means that, um, for example, at the Africa Union Summit last year, the heads of states and governments of the African Union made commitments um, to addressing um, um, something like AMR using a multi-sectorial approach. Um, so um, that is a, a enough political backing for any of our 55 member states to be able to advocate for things like policies, enabling policies, domestic financing, um, to addressing issues around, um, for example, antimicrobial resistance, um, genetic disease spillover. So I think that is that has been our approach. And one of the things that we are also trying to do um, this year now is also addressing issues around, because uh, at the African Union, we have the phytosanitary um, 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 organizations, we have um, organ um, African Union organizations that focus solely on agriculture, environment and climate change. What we are trying to do at the African Union now is bring all of this expertise together to set up an interagency a group that can coordinate, collaborate with international partners as well as domestic partners, and most importantly, convey the message. So what we are trying to do is we will prioritize setting, um, um, uh, uh, based on the gaps that we know, setting needs of our member states and we will be able to present it to the Africa Union Summit um, come next year and, and, and of course have it, always having a, a, a seat at the table at subsequent summits. So yes, that is our approach at the African Union. Really, really good. Um, final comments then from Dr. Dante in terms of scaling up. You are part of the ASEAN political configuration, etc. What's your view in terms of how to scale up either from smaller projects or national-wide programs to also taking this at the regional level? The world needs to extend effort in delivering trustworthy data sharing, including genomic data to enable real-time integrated global surveillance of human, animal, and plant disease, taking advantage of big data, artificial intelligence, and the internet of things. We also find the benefit of conducting risk mitigation in traditional food market, the hotspot area, as well as join human animal environment risk assessment to identify health risk zone from zoonotic disease treat for better preparation. Such effort will significantly contribute to delivering informed timely evidence the preventing animal to human spillover that may cause global endemic and pandemic in our region in Asia. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, and we are now coming to an end uh, of this panel. So just uh, is for me to thank you very much apologizing to those that had questions that were not able to put the questions. Uh, but this whole um, discussion has been about spillover. Uh, and in some way, the negative spillover, for me at least, this Justice Hour has been a very positive spillover. Me being a health person, learning from other colleagues in other sectors. So I think, I mean, we should stop the negative spillover, but we should encourage the positive spillover, especially across what we can call uh, sectors and silos. And I hope we will also have a spillover beyond this seminar so that everybody who's participating reach out to the messages, because I think most of you have listened also uh, uh, concur, agree with what has been said. Now it's my privilege uh, and pleasure then to hand back, I think, to, to Minister Per olsson free uh, for your final reflections and words to all of us. Over to you, Per, please. Actually, just before the minister jumps in, uh -huh. um, a few final comments from us just in terms of next steps and so on. Uh -huh. Sorry. Um, <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Nordstrom, and all of our distinguished panelists for such a thoughtful and insightful discussion. This is immensely helpful for our future work in the coalition. I've written down brilliant insights from all of you, but I just wanted to underscore something that Helen Clark said. If we don't pay now, we will pay later. There is a global pandemic fund in discussion at the moment amongst glo global leaders and it unfortunately focuses mainly on preparedness and containment. We humbly ask that those of you that are making decisions on this ensure that its scope includes prevention at the source. I hope you've all enjoyed today's symposium. Thank you so much for joining us at a time when I know so many of you are busy. Um, Nigel will now briefly mention some next steps. Thank you all. Thank you, Sunila, uh, Dr. Nordstrom, the ministry, and all of the panelists. Thank you all for joining us. A very special thanks also to our colleague at Dalborough Catalyst, Joe Evans, for an incredible job behind the scenes, making the technology work so smoothly today. Before I give the final word and reflections to our co-host, Minister Per Olsen-Fried, just a couple of points on next steps. 
So first of all, please do follow us on social media. Visit our website to learn more at preventingfuturepandemics.org. And if you'd like to get involved, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. We will send you all an email sharing key points and outcomes from today's discussion, as well as links to the videos and the highlights from the Zoom recording. We also plan to start producing a regular e-newsletter and we'll share that with you all as well. We know that we have a long road ahead to change policies and institutions and to mobilize the resources to support the efforts so desperately needed on the ground. And we will be taking our message to the Climate COP26, to the Biodiversity COP15 at the intersection of health and ecology, and hopefully with Sweden's help to the landmark Stockholm plus 50 gatherings next year. We very much hope that you will all join us on this journey. And now a final word from our co-host, Minister Per Olsen Fried, and thank you again, Minister, for your leadership. Thank you, Nigel, um, and thank you to uh, all of our panelists and, and everyone else who joined the discussion with comments and, and interventions uh, from, from the floor, uh, sort to say. I think it showed the importance of bringing people together, of, of bringing insights from different fields together, uh, and it's been really valuable. Um, at the GA so far this year, the discussions around the pandemic have focused on vaccine rollout, on preparedness and, and response, and, and it's all important and, and very much needed. Uh, but what is so important with the discussions that we've had today is that the focus on decreasing the risk of pandemics and, from break, and, and, and stopping them from breaking out the, in the first place. And at the, at the same time, the very importance of, of, of action on biodiversity and climate and how that is in, underpinned by the very strong human health arguments that's been presented. And I think it was really valuable that the right space or the human rights perspective was brought into this discourse uh, also at the end of, of, of today's discussion. We live in a world where we have a number of parallel crises uh, that are intertwined and they're going on at the same time. And, and it is about time that the solutions that we present are as integrated as the crisis we are, we are, are, are witnessing. And we're soon halfway through the uh, Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030, and we're painfully reminded how important it is for us to, to improve and continue to work uh, in a holistic uh, way. Um, this holistic approach, um, I think, is the big takeaway from today's discussion. And it will feed into, of course, how we work and how we continue to think and, and fund uh, and make decisions in the future. However, as Minister for International Development Cooperation, my headache is that development aid is a very limited resource. And we must uh, work and be catalytic and, and, and attract also other financial instruments and financial flows uh, along alongside with development aid, to have these instruments move away from being drivers of, of what actually you know, brings us to tipping points where we destroy our planet and destroy our human health and move them into uh, being tipping points um, for better ecosystems and, 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 and for climate change um, solutions. We need to, instead of driving degradation of biodiversity and extreme weather, we need to be drivers of, of restoration, of, of rights-based recovery, of resilience uh, of our ecosystems and of our livelihoods. So I really hope that today's discussion can be the start of something other irreversible, a discussion uh, where we, and a work where we can continue to connect the dots, where we can continue to break the silence between human rights, human health, and planetary health. And I look forward to continue work with all of you in this endeavor. Thank you very much for, to everyone for today's work.